and welcome to Governance Dialogues, a program that I have the pleasure to host on a weekly basis. My name is Elisa Cole, and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center, which is a think tank and advisory firm that works on advancing um, corporate and um, public governance uh, objectives. And through Governance Dialogues, a program that we've launched um, uh, about two months ago during the lockdown, we basically aim to demystify the, wor the world of governance and render it more interesting and engaging in conversations and hard-hitting conversations with thought leaders, be they philosophers, C-suite members, board members, um, and other observers with interesting opinions in the world of governance. And in today's dialogue, I would like to specifically focus on the world of tech and governance and the sort of somewhat awkward marriage sometimes between those two worlds. Um, and for those of you who have been watching and have subscribed to our YouTube channel, this is a topic that we've already explored in one uh, episode of this program in conversation with Rafik Malik, who is a senior um, advisor to the CEO of Saudi Telecom uh, and an executive with breadth of a breadth of experience. And a topic that I think is worth um, delving further into as we're having a number of uh, interesting developments that are, that are, that are uh, topical and um, worth exploring. And this is a, a topic uh, also on which we've written widely uh, in, um, in an article, for example, in, uh, which I've called controversially dinosaur governance in the age of unicorns, where we talk about how the world of tech and governance may be actually misfit or how the corporate governance frameworks today might be slightly outdated for the world of large tech companies as we're seeing them uh, today. Um, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to host today somebody who has a breadth of experience on this topic, uh, Eric, Eric Vermeulen, who's uh, joining us today from the Netherlands. Eric, welcome to Governance Dialogues. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to... Um, to have you on this program. I think last time we saw each other was actually in, the Tilbur in Tilburg, uh, where you teach and where I also gave uh, a lecture. Um, and just for the purpose of a brief intro for, the, for our audience, you have uh, a breadth of roles um, mixing academic, entrepreneurial, boards, uh, and corporate experience. And so um, Eric is, uh, is uh, your uh, uh, basically the director of international law program at the University of Tilburg. You're also um, head of um, uh, governance at uh, Signify, which is formerly Philips Lightning. Uh, you also are uh, co-owner of a Michelin uh, star restaurant where I had the pleasure to, uh, to once uh, dine. Um, and, and you are also advising international organizations um, such as the OECD, uh, World Bank and many others. So uh, a diversity of perspectives um, and particularly I know that um, from, from our previous conversations you're fascinated by the world of tech, whether we talk about artificial intelligence, blockchain, um, robotics and how these are, are affecting essentially um, how we work, how we live and, and how we, we study. So with that um, intro, I would like to delve into, into um, uh, the conversation and really sort of to the point of the previous, uh, um, uh, the po previous point that I was making in this article, uh, Dinosaur Governance in the Age of Unicorns, where I argue that corporate governance frameworks today are outmoded for, for the large tech firms. I would like to ask you first whether you agree with that perspective and whether, to what extent are they outmoded? Is, uh, is there an argument, is there justification for having uh, corporate governance frameworks that are more specific to the tech sector as we have, for example, governance frameworks that are specific to um, banks or insurance companies where board members of banks have specific uh, fit and proper test requirements, for example. Eric, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, so the answer is yes. Um, I think the, uh, the corporate governance frameworks, at least the way we think about corporate governance and the way we, we teach and train corporate governance, that's outdated. I don't agree that is, that is only applicable to tech companies though. Um, it's applicable to all companies everywhere. Um, you could even argue that every company is a tech company. Walmart, retailers, a tech company uh, and a media company. Um, Signify uh, Philips Lighting, obviously a tech company, but, but not the big tech as what most people are referring to. But we have to really rethink corporations and corporate governance. And um, I've done a lot of research uh, on this topic. And um, I even wrote an article, The End of Corporations. Uh, it was a blog and I gave a presentation, Singapore, The End of Corporations, and people scares the hell out of people because all of a sudden they don't know how to think. 
And I think that's the issue with many of the corporate governance guidelines, principles that we have. They might still fit because they talk about stakeholders and they talk, they talk about basically everything. But the way they think is still uh, shareholder value maximization. They still think in hierarchies. They still think in closed corporate uh, entities and that world that still exists but companies that still adhere to that idea they are going to disappear really really very soon so most companies tend to go and transform themselves to ecosystems but then particularly scholars corporate law scholars or corporate governance experts they don't really understand that because yes, it is about stakeholders and it is about ESG and uh, ESG as environmental, uh, environment, social and, and governance, uh, which becomes part of the, let's say the corporate leadership, the corporate strategy of companies. And if they just ignore it, they are going to disappear. They will not be relevant anymore. And one thing uh, that most people then don't understand is how is it possible that corporate leaders can focus on all the stakeholders, right? Uh, they should focus on just one because otherwise it's getting too difficult for them. That's an argument that you re hear and read a lot, but just they don't understand it. If you look at a company like Microsoft, where the CEO in a vlog in October 2019 said, well, the world changed. It's about all the stakeholders, consumers, employees, investors, and other stakeholders. Um, at, Simul you have to think about them simultaneously because they are going to, um, they are part of your product and your service these days. Um, so I have this kind of model that we will discuss later, uh, which I call the R model. Uh, so companies have to embrace the R model because that's all about remaining relevant. And remaining relevant is the issue today. Mm. So um, that's really interesting because we, we did talk, in, in fact, in the previous um, uh, episode of Governance Dialogues, I hosted Colin Mayer, former uh, dean of the Oxford Business School, and you probably know him as well. And we talked about this responsibility to stakeholders and stakeholderism more generally. But with you specifically, if I may just ask some pointed uh, controversial questions. So you, if we think about uh, corporate governance frameworks, you know, we, we both have interacted and I've worked also with the OECD. So in terms of how these frameworks are, and you talk about the generalization or the level of generality of these frameworks, if we talk about how they regulate corporate behavior, would it be, in your view, um, justified to have uh, further amendments to these as we have, for example, an audit committee or Remco committee? Would tech committee at large tech companies in your mind be warranted? Currently, even large ones like Facebook don't have one. And what about the role of chief technology officer? After the last crisis, we have the role of the CRO, which has gotten elevated significantly. Are these specific regulatory requirements in your world, in your opinion, warranted, desirable, or even justified? Well, I know the answer is no. I, the, the problem is that as soon as, okay, if you look at the, um, the guidelines and the frameworks and the, the principles that we have out there, they're all very uh, broad and very flexible and basically all models fit. Uh, however, uh, as I mentioned, people start thinking in a particular way. So whenever I give a training, no matter where I am, whether it's South America, Asia or Europe, people still think about, you know, Oh yeah, it's corporate governance. So if they look at the OECD principles, they still think hierarchical structure, shareholder value maximization. We have a board of directors. The board of directors monitors and supervises management in order to avoid uh, managerial misbehavior. That's, that's a wrong way of thinking. Um, I think board of directors, and there was a study out there that showed that the companies where the board of directors actually have the advisory role or take the advisory role more seriously, they outperform the companies that just have a supervisory board that sits there and monitors. And I started to realize this when I became a, a, a board member myself. You know, the way they are organized and the way we are trained is completely wrong. Uh, we are trained to just monitor, to sit there like six times, seven times a year, uh, listening to uh, you know a CEO and other managers giving a fantastic presentation. Uh, 
um, it's what it's called a waterfall board. So whenever there's a board meeting, you get tons of documents on your desk. You have to go through them. You have all these committees. They do their work. Then we sit there. We have too many agenda items. Then when we go to finance, we listen to the audit committee. When we go to another topic, we go to that committee. And then we move on. And then at the end, we said, oh, yes, we made it. We went through the agenda. God, we were great. But that's not what companies need these days. They need to have a board of directors that helps them find what's right. Because today, when you are a corporate manager, you just don't know what will happen tomorrow. So if I look at Philips Lighting, I think in the last couple, nice like past four years we went from like four competitors to 500 uh it was all about because of technology right we went from conventional lights to led lights which lasts much longer which means that you have to change your business model as your business model is still replacing a product well you will be out of business very soon so we become more service oriented products become services when you offer services you realize as a company oh my god so I have to create a platform, otherwise I cannot offer anything. So I have to, to allow more people, more stakeholders to my platform in order to help me find the right service for my consumer. There's a fantastic study out there done by the Boston Consulting Group where they look at the, um, the car industry. And car manufacturers tend to have like three or four partners. Now they have like 30, 40, 50. If you look at Philips uh, Medical, uh, Philips, which is now medical uh, or healthcare and medical systems, they tend to have much more, many more partners than they had in the past because you have to open up, you have to become this ecosystem where more people try to help you figure out what they need. Back to Microsoft, if you look at, and we will talk about it later maybe, if you look at Satya Nadella on, tweet, on Twitter on July 25th, last year he tweeted it's so wonderful to have so many consumers on our campuses today to co-create with our employees the next product that stakeholder thinking it's not just having a, a report that you send out there and and hopefully people read it no it's the dialogue the engagement that you have with stakeholders so back to your question just quickly no we don't need regulators to come with uh, guidelines now because they don't understand the ecosystem so the only thing they do they make things more difficult and we get another box ticking document which we definitely don't need okay so from from your perspective i think it's you're taking more of a of a um, of a perspective that firms need to take a role in this and, and define what is suitable to the to the corporate culture uh, from a board or c-suite perspective to create to design their own uh, to cook their own corporate governance but there's one interesting point that that i think you were mentioning that i'd like to come back to and that is tweeting uh you know because we, we've had this episode this earlier this year where Elon Musk had tweeted that uh, the public investment fund at, at, uh, at will be acquiring sh uh, the, the shares of the company. And of course, that had uh, SEC investigating uh, his behavior and the company got fined. And we know how that story had unfolded from there. I think it was a very interesting story to watch. And I think that that conversation also has a te uh, technology angle, not only because Tesla is, is a largely technology-driven company, but because of, of uh, tweeting or the role of corporate communications and who is actually responsible and in what form, we're used to having you know, financial communication in the form of audit reports, in the, in the form of annual reports. All of that world is getting, not completely, but also outdated. Um, and if, if CEOs and board members can, can communicate on social media and other uh, manners, how should that be regulated in your opinion? Should, it, should they be allowed? Uh, should there be a disclaimer that, you know, I'm communicating on my own behalf and you do what you want with that information? Or should there be a, a, a proper um, sort of, so, should social media be integrated in corporate communications in a, in a proper way, uh, perhaps slightly differently than it is now? Oh God, many questions here. Uh, so let me try to answer them. So uh, one thing is that I, I don't see, to get back to bond, this, this point, the, the point that you made earlier, I don't think that corporations should somehow start to self-regulate. What I mean is if corporations don't take stakeholders seriously and don't come up with their own model, they will not survive. That's what you see already now. And I think the Corona virus just accelerated the future. Uh, the pressure is really huge. That brings me back to Twitter and to communication. So communication is extremely important for companies, but it's not just, communicating like reporting or disclosing or being transparent is starting a dialogue. 
And um, social media is a fantastic way to start a dialogue. So I argue that CEOs and other managers should definitely use social media in order to have that dialogue with other people. Now, Elon Musk is just one example, and we get back to him uh, very quickly. But there's like Mahindra and Mahindra, another car company in India. And their CEO, which doesn't look like Elon Musk at all, the guy is a guy in a suit. He's using Twitter, and he's arguing that CEOs that don't understand the power of social media are ignorant because it's a business tool. It's a business tool that you cannot ignore these days. It's a tool that helps you start a dialogue with your stakeholders. So what do you think? If you want to engage with stakeholders and you want, this, you want to make this part of the identity of a company and part of the DNA of a company, that you do this with an annual report? No, you do this with social media. That's how people communicate these days. And that's a very powerful tool. Now, should that be regulated? Well, yes and, yes and no, but I think it is already regulated. And that's where Elon Musk came in. When he's doing something stupid, he will get fined. People will tell him that he has to be careful. But it's this social media that, that makes... It's part, part of the reason why Tesla is doing so well. I think it's now the second car manufacturer, if you look at the, uh, the market valuation. Um, and the reason is, is this ecosystem idea. We might not like Elon Musk, but we can trace him, we can track him. He makes promises and he, he tends to keep them. And investors tend to like that a lot, including me. Um, so it's this uncorporate culture that they create and that uncorporate culture, and this is the interesting point, when you create an uncorporate culture, people start to trust you. So you can use social media to build trust with your stakeholders. And if you don't do that, well, and you do it the old way, you will not create a lot of trust. And yes, people will make mistakes. Should you have a, a separate regulator doing this or come up with another set of rules? I don't think so. And that's the power of ecosystems. And particularly now, you will be punished really quickly uh, so you it's also the stakeholders themselves that will punish and that brings me to employees i think employees become a much more powerful stakeholder group than they actually were before they had to they need the regulation you know to uh, get protection but right now if they don't like something they send an open letter also they use social media to put pressure on management and it's powerful yes so go ahead Actually, so on, on that point of employees, um, I think it's an interesting um, it's an interesting point you're making, especially during this crisis where there's been so much uh, uh, emphasis on the S of ESG. Uh, and if you look at a slightly different angle, sort of not the angle of uh, CEOs engaging with social media, but uh, social media actually engaging with the political world. And we've seen uh, perhaps for the first time in, in history, as far as I know, uh, uh, Twitter uh, add some some uh, clarifications to President Trump's tweets, basically trying to um, create what they think is a notion of, of uh, sort of correct or factual uh, information for the public. Uh, and, and speaking of employees, Mark Zuckerberg, who refused uh, to take that stance, was uh, heavily criticized by his employees who, who, who went public and said, you know, we don't agree with the policy of the company. Some have indeed resigned. So there is that internal dialogue in tech companies and, and, and outward dialogue with the political sphere where they're taking a role that's perhaps even larger than they did when, when the Arab uprisings happened in 2011 when they facilitated some of these uh, indirectly. So what is your take on, 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 on these developments? Shall, shall the corporate or the tech world have a say in, in a political uh, world, polit the world of political governance? So should, is, are they going beyond their remit? Well, no, no, they shouldn't, and I don't think they want to. Um, and they struggle um, with what's happening. And, and, and that's where the whole stakeholder idea, I think, is becoming very, very important. And yes, we should have more discussions like this. We should have more, more people enter the dialogue. Uh, because that's why I believe in let stakeholder governance or stakeholder capitalism I think you call it as well in one of your pieces uh, that appeared at the Harvard uh, whatever forum. Um, and, and, and I like that a lot because that's how we create balance. Um, to give you another example, 
this is like social media, but AI is, is that's more powerful. And I think Google or Alphabet. I, I told, uh, I had a discussion with uh, several mathematicians and I don't claim to be any, but it was just about AI. And they said, well, it, it seems like Google or Alphabet, they have a kind of monopoly on, on AI these days and they struggle with it. So they tended to come up and this is a very good example of how governance works. So they said, okay, we set up a, an ethics board outside the company. That's a new corporate governance idea. We set up an ethics board and this is the composition. It, and then the employees, one day after, I think, said, well, we don't like that composition at all. Uh, that's not a good, fair composition to have in order to have a real ethics board. And then they killed it. But this shows that companies, the big tech companies, are struggling with the idea. Um, the CEO of Microsoft said, well, there might be bias in this data. We have to think about that. But they cannot do that themselves. They need the ecosystem to help them. That's other developers. That's like the openness that you create with these, uh, within these companies. Now, again, you tend to say big tech, big tech, big tech, but the same happens with the older industries as well. If you look at energy, the oil and gas companies, well, they try to become ecosystems really rapidly in order to survive and remain relevant. This is relevancy issue that uh, becomes more and more important in the corporate world, and we have to understand that better. I agree, but, but to the point on AI, because it's an interesting point that you're raising and, and it's a point that I also written on um, in an article that I think I published about a year ago on governance of AI, because nobody's really um, speaking or writing or researching on, on governance of AI, which is arguably kind of <laughs> where civilization is going. I, as you know, the European Commission is, was, has some forays and established a committee of experts trying to establish a, a governance framework for, for AI. And Singapore, I think, was the first country in um, uh, at the last Davos meeting, uh, when, when there still were physical meetings, to, to, to have a, uh, launched their own uh, AI framework. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that. You know, how advanced are these where are we going with those um, and, and, and what is the future of, of governance of AI in your perspective? Ooh, uh, it's a very good point. Um, so, okay, uh, you mentioned that I am the director of an international business law program in Tilburg, which is correct. Uh, so I in introduced uh, some new uh, courses. Uh, one is coding for lawyers and emphasize on for lawyers. So I don't want to make my lawyers coders. That's not going to happen. Uh, but I want them to understand how coders and how technologists think. Uh, the same I have the course AI for lawyers. Because I was at a conference once and there were many lawyers. And the only thing we talked about the whole day, should a robot have a passport? And I thought, why are we discussing this? Because they had Mr. Data from Star Trek in mind, walking around the street and telling you, hey, Alyssa, how's the, how are you doing today? Uh, do you think the weather is good? Well, we are still far away from that kind of idea. Um, so we have to understand AI better. But, you know, when you look at AI, there were several AI winters where things were like hyped and then we figured out we are not that far. Right now, I think we will not see a hype. Uh, AI is becoming more and more powerful, uh, machine learning, deep learning, it can do more and more things. Uh, it becomes more human in the sense that the way we interact with technology, in the past we needed this mouse or we needed a keyboard. Uh, now we just say, I'm not going to say it because then all my phones will react, but <laughs> hey, blah, blah, and then you ask a question. That becomes better and better and better. Uh, so we don't even realize that we, we, we feed AI and we interact with AI. And that makes it, to me, dangerous. And yes, we should have more open discussion where we need, again, are the stakeholders as well. This is not something that you should just leave to the technologist. That's where lawyers, philosophers, all these people come in as well. However, they have to speak the same language. Otherwise, you get very weird conferences. It's true. And it's exactly actually with that spirit that we launched this program is to have philosophers, um, thinkers, professors on this program and address this world, which they are addressing from a very, very different angles and to try to make sense of it perhaps uh, together. But for the purpose of this program, we promised to keep them to less than half an hour. I'd like to perhaps ask you one 
one last question, um, not specific to tech companies, but, but in, in terms of the role of technology uh, in um, aiding and abetting, so, so to speak, this current uh, transition to the virtual, virtual boardrooms, virtual shareholder assemblies. I mean, companies of, of all sectors, and especially listed companies, of course, are going through a tremendous transition in, in, uh, in basically trying to find technologies that can foster uh, effective, um, effective communications um, within boards, with their shareholders, between boards and management. And it's not, I, I don't think, just a question of uh, getting solutions like board pads to board members that they can store their documents on. That existed before. So we're talking about, I think, in my perspective, a much more fundamental um, transformation, at least as, as far as it looks today, uh, unless a, a miracle vaccine is found tomorrow. What is your uh, thinking about, about where we stand in terms of progress in this transition? And uh, perhaps um, a few words on, on, on um, you know, what boards need and what, what might be their blind spots today uh, to, to, from a perspective of, of tech. It's a very good question and uh, with this question I can um, basically uh, link all the things that uh, maybe are still hanging there, uh, including Elon Musk's, uh, let's say, uh, social media behavior. Um, I think, um, so yeah, whenever I talk uh, to corporate governance experts and technology, the, they, they come up with like, oh yeah, this could facilitate or uh, make the shareholder meeting more efficient or this could make board meetings more efficient. Um, well, now with the coronavirus, uh, our shareholder meeting was online, went really well. Uh, I think we get used to that more and more, but that's not what technology is doing with governance. That's just, that's retrofitting. That's okay. We have the old corporate governance framework and oh my God, technology can do certain things here and there. That retrofitting idea, um, I don't believe in that. I think, and I'm certain, I'm positive people might not believe in me and that's why we have to do this this conversation again in two three years and then see whether i was right or not we will go i mentioned when we will talk about a board this waterfall idea so when you have board meetings you get tons of documents and then uh, it's a couple of weeks you don't hear anything and then tons of documents again i think we go with all technology to more like a continuous governance um, which means we and social media or artificial intelligence, social media, we can track continuously what's going on. So annual reports, they will disappear. That will be a continuous reporting. Some companies are already uh, experimenting with this, right? So people can track. It's not that you have to wait a year to see how last year was going. It's just you track continuously. And, and auditors and accountants, well, that will be automated because it's the AI that will detect things very, very quickly. If things go wrong, rated party transactions will be detected instantly. So that's the new governance. And I think the best companies understand that. And that's why I like companies like Netflix and, and Tesla, because without even maybe realizing it, it's this continuous governance that they embrace. So his tweets, well, sometimes not very smart, but he's keeping his promises and we can track them and trace them continuously. You know what I mean? The guy, I don't know how many followers he has right now, millions, but he treats something weird. Oh, Australia, you have some power problems. I'm fixing that in the next month. If I succeed, you pay. If I don't, well, you get it for free. That's a very bold statement. And I'm a lawyer, I would not like my CEO to make it, but we can track and trace it. And sometimes he says things that I would never ever have said, but it's not about become likable, it's becoming traceable. It is uncorporate culture where we use technology to co-create and have an instant dialogue about things. And that empowers employees, that empowers the consumer. And that's why I believe in ESG, because ESG is something that the consumer wants. All of the E, like climate change, the S with the whole COVID-19, and now we have the G with diversity, uh, which we can actually track and trace instantly. That's the new world of governance. Problem though is that we don't need new guidelines maybe, we need new training. And that's why I like what you are doing so much. We need new training and a new dialogue because this old stuff, 
well, you can talk about it, but companies are not doing it anymore. So it's, it's theoretic. It's becoming more and more theoretical and outdated. So you might have this history discussion, but I'm more interested in like uh, what our future is uh, holding for us. Yeah. And that's why we wanted to, I wanted to host you on this program to have this exchange of ideas. And I think that a number of thoughts that you put forward are, are novel in terms of, you know, whether we are retrofitting old corporate governance frameworks. And, and I agree with you that this discussion about minor changes in the periphery of um, existing frameworks might actually perhaps be missing the entire point. Um, and, and in other ideas that you've mentioned in this dialogue in terms of waterfall of change, in, tr in terms of transition of corporate reporting to, uh, to continuous uh, communication, uh, the role of social media and that and the traceability of communication. I think they're all um, perhaps concepts or, or uh, that are worth delving into future episodes of this program and it would be a pleasure to have you uh, perhaps in less than two or three years time as you as you suggested to to talk about what what the realities uh, the emerging realities look like but for the purpose of this dialogue uh, unfortunately due to um, our promise to keep these under half an hour long I'd like to thank you very much for, for joining us and sharing your views uh, and hope to have you on future dialogues thank you so much Thank you, Eric. And good luck. And for the purposes of our audience, we thank you for joining us um, on this uh, episode of Governance Dialogues. We will be continuing this program with weekly uh, updates um, and conversations with uh, the world's uh, foremost, what we think are the world's foremost thinkers in the world of governance. So thank you for joining and please feel free to um, subscribe and share your uh, views and opinions. Mm -hmm.